welcome to the At Peace Parents podcast. I'm Casey, and I'm here to empower you in your decision making as a parent of a demand avoidant child. My goal is to share insights that will generate aha moments and support your connection with your child. I'm a mom of two amazing little boys, one of whom is PDA, and I've worked with hundreds of parents just like you to teach them how to lead their child out of burnout and find the clarity, peace, and sense of community they need. What is internalized pathological demand avoidance, and how is it distinct from externalized pathological demand avoidance? So this is a question that's been coming up a lot, not just in my Instagram page and Facebook page, but also within the program, the our signature program, the Paradigm Shift program, because a lot of the parents participating are realizing that they may be PDA, but just an internalized expression. So today I want to take some time together to talk through the five characteristics that we can relate to PDA and see how they're different between an internalized expression and an externalized expression. And then I want to talk to you about three patterns that I've noticed now that I've worked with almost more than a thousand families and also many of whom are parents who they themselves identify as PDA. So let's talk about the five characteristics of pathological demand avoidance and how they may express differently for internalized PDA. Okay, so we have five characteristics, the survival drive for autonomy that consistently overrides other survival instincts like safety, hygiene, toileting, eating, and or sleeping. We have equalizing behavior, which is the behavioral expression of the disability. And often when we see an externalized PDA, or this is what looks like controlling or defiant or oppositional behavior, we have masking, that phenomenon where a child can look like two totally different versions of themselves. Four, the need for constant undivided attention. And then five, the fluctuating nature of the disability because nervous system stress is cumulative. Okay, so let's start with a definition and then I'm going to go through all five of those. So first of all, I want to just be clear that internalized PDA and externalized PDA are not about temperament because a lot of times people conflate internalized with introverted and externalized with outgoing. Often our externalized PDAers are very social, they're very interested in other children, you know, they don't have as high of social communication differences, but that's not always the case. Okay, and the same can be said for internalized PDA where they may be outgoing themselves. What we're referring to with these two terms, internalized and externalized, are just the nervous system pathways that activation goes down. So what is true for both internalized and externalized PDA is that the survival brain alerts the body that there's a threat, either dangerous or life-threatening, and sets off the nervous system. This is a subconscious process. Anytime there's a neuroception of losses of autonomy or equality. So that's true for both, right? That's the root cause of what sets off the nervous system. For our externalized PDAers, we see the externalization of the nervous system response because it's fight flight, right? We see these kids scream, we see them act like a feral animal, they destroy things, they, they elope or abscond out the front door. We see the fight flight response. However, internalized PDA can be much harder to spot because there's different pathways that the nervous system is going on and they're internal, right? They're not outward. So this could include freeze, which is a mobilized fight flight response, but then there's also the immobilization like a deer in the headlights. So you don't necessarily see that defiance or the running away. There's the shutdown response, which is like the antelope who's running from the lion that gets caught in their jaws. And then there's a nervous system response of like feign dead, collapse or shut down, right? And that again, it's not under the conscious control. It's just what the nervous system does. And then additionally, 
for internalized PDA, we can also see two other hybrid states, which are fawning, right? That's like the automatic compliance of like, okay, okay, I'm just like having a reflexive nervous system response to protect myself and go along to get along. And then we have appeasement, which is kind of like people pleasing, but it's actually a mobilized response that recruits the social engagement system where the PDA is monitoring the authority could be the parent, could be the teacher, and using the social engagement system to guarantee their safety. Okay, so those are all nervous system states that can be related to internalized PDA, and you're not seeing these big explosive behaviors that are often associated with externalized PDAers, okay? So let's take the first of the five characteristics, the survival drive for autonomy. So as I said, it's, it's going to be the same root cause, what sets off the nervous system, regardless of if it's internalized or externalized. But the way that it expresses in the nervous system is going to be distinct. Okay, so there will be an impact on basic needs over time, right? And this could be withholding, it could be constipation, it could be a toileting regression. And this is true not just for children. I've worked with families who've had teens, tweens, and even young adult children who had digestive issues because this is a physiological response, right? Where we have and caprices, we have UTIs, we have, you know, just to ground it, a young adult who is withholding for 48 hours, right? And not voiding and not going to the bathroom, right? And these can cause medical issues. So these are physiological responses. We have selective mutism, like losing the ability to speak under moments of stress or when cumulative stress reaches the point where it's past the threshold. We have, you know, with younger children, if their metabolism is speeding up and they're in mobilization like fight flight, you might see, you know, accidents, you might see loss of appetite because their metabolism is speeding up and you see control around eating. In older children, this might look like severe restricted eating that gets diagnosed as eating disorders or ARFID. Okay, so for both internalized PDA and externalized PDA, it's the same root cause that sets off the perception of threat, the same neurotype, but where, how and where it expresses in the nervous system is either externalized and internalized. And I want to caveat this with the fact that no human is all internalized or all externalized, right? And actually, we can't stay in one nervous system state forever, right? We can't just go into shutdown and stay there or we'll die, so we go back into mobilization and fight or flight, and then we may drop back down into dorsal or shutdown. Okay, so the important point here is it's, it's not about severity, and it's not about a difference in neuroception. It's about what the, the human's nervous system does and whether or not we see it easily from the outside as parents, teachers, therapists, or clinicians, or it's more hidden to us because it's going on internally, okay? So the next place we're going to see a difference is what's with what's called equalizing behavior, which is for an externalized PDA or very easy to spot in a lot of ways, right? Like maybe we say, hey, can you pick up your shoes? And our child like is like, oh, and picks up the shoes. They comply with the request, but their nervous system has a reaction to the loss of autonomy and me being above the child, and so their nervous system tries to get back to safety to be equal to or above me. And so the child might go and like pull all the leaves off a plant that I really like or knock all my books off the table. There's like this immediate equalizing towards me, the safest of the safe, or towards a sibling, right? So it's controlling behavior, criticizing everything that you're saying, you know, impulsively interrupting you or the sibling, you know, hovering around them and accidentally kicking over their stuff. This is equalizing, which is to get back to a place of nervous system safety. With an internalized pda -er, who is also having a nervous system response in, in reaction to perceived losses of autonomy and equality, the equalizing might be towards self, okay? So what does that mean? 
instead of criticizing me, like you're stupid, stop talking, you have a fat butt, you know, swearing, which you might see with an externalized PDA or, or just like making a noise over your speech so that you can't continue talking. For an internalized PDA or you might see the same behavior towards self, right? So this could be more verbal. Like, I'm so stupid. I'm a bad kid. I'm a terrible kid. I hate myself. I wish I were dead. So a lot of like criticism and equalizing towards self. It could be more physical, like picking out eyebrows or scratching the skin until it bleeds, hitting head against the wall, or even, you know, if they're older teen tween into them more self-harm. It could also be destroying one's own things or creations versus going over to the sibling or the parent and destroying their things or disorganizing their things. Okay, so again, it's the same mechanism, but it's directed towards self versus directed towards the safest of the safe nervous system in the home, which is usually the lead parent or siblings, especially the weakest nervous system. Okay, next we have masking. So for our externalized PDAers, we often have a, a scenario where our children are totally two different versions of themselves to the degree that like other people don't believe you, whether it's like grandparents, teachers, therapists, your friends that you have known forever. They meet your child and the child masks and it's like mind blowing how typical they can look when they're doing that, especially at school, right? So this is the internalization of the threat response for our externalized PDAers. And often, you know, they're able to do this. Their subconscious is perceiving less safety at school. And so they're internalizing that fight flight response. It doesn't mean it's not happening, right? It's building. And then when they get home, you see those big explosions. Okay, this is different than learning a social behavior that is like imitating neurotypical norms. My perspective is this is a mechanism of the nervous system related to the perception of threat, which is like what defines everything in pathological demand avoidance, PDA or pervasive drive for autonomy. Okay, for our internalized PDAers, you might not see this dichotomy of like, they're absolutely two different versions of themselves because they're always internalizing the threat response. So they're not coming home necessarily and having these big explosions and destroying things and being like a feral animal or aggressive or manipulative or controlling towards others. They may be continuing to experience the internalization of the threat. What's important about understanding this though is it doesn't mean it's not happening inside the body and having a physiological response. And this is why I believe we see a pattern where we recognize our externalized PDA is often pretty early because you can't ignore it, right? Like they are screaming and they're throwing things and they look like a feral animal and you can see the data, right? And you can see the di dichotomy of like, they're two different versions. Like how can they be at school like a typical child and then come home and I'm seeing this version of them, okay? And they're, ex they're equalizing against you constantly. And so very early on, parents can, even if they don't know about PDA, they're noticing something, right? versus an internalized PDA or who may be quite compliant. Maybe they're a little bit shut down. Maybe they seem anxious, but they're not necessarily so obvious to the outside looking in. And it's only when they reach close to burnout or their threshold of tolerance that we're starting to see that this may be going on. Okay. The fourth characteristic, sometimes present for internalized PDA, but almost always present for externalized PDAers, is the need for constant engagement and undivided attention. So my son is externalized PDA and he constantly needs one-on-one -on -one attention and focused engagement. Like very rarely can I like be doing the dishes and chatting with him while he's doing something else or, you know, I'm like looking up and paying attention to what he's doing, sort of like a more neurotypical interaction like I can sometimes do with my younger son. With my PDA son, it is one-on-one -on -one attention with an adult who's engaging in his interests. 
Okay, and if not, it will start to escalate. If I'm trying to return a task, text, if I'm trying to do dishes, there is a either escalation towards me, constant interruption, or if I'm like, I need you to wait a second, right? A reasonable request, like I need you to be patient, I'm just finishing this up. And I will say it's better now because he has a window of tolerance to tolerate that. But two, three, four years ago, he would immediately go and start, you know, bugging his brother and equalizing against his brother. So it was a cost benefit decision of like, can I do the dishes or do I need to protect his baby brother, right? Because he would go over there and accidentally destroy his things, tell him he was doing it wrong, you know, hover over him physically, etc. For what I've learned over the past years and now working with hundreds of families is that internalized PDAers do not necessarily need the constant undivided attention that externalized PDAers do. Okay, so that is probably the main difference that I've seen anecdotally and with patterns working with such a distribution. Finally, the fifth characteristic, the fact that this is all cumulative, which is so important to understand because we're often looking through the lens of like an ABC framework for understanding the logic of behavior. What was the antecedent or what happened right before? What was the behavior? And then what was the consequence, right? Whereas for our PDAers, it's much more like a building, building, building over days, weeks, sometimes months and years, and then a tipping point when they reach their threshold for how much their body and nervous system can tolerate activation, 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 then they reach their threshold and you see either burnout or these huge moments where it's like, is this a regression? What happened? Okay, so this is also true for internalized PDAers. All right, so the one thing I wanna say before I talk about the three other patterns that I've noticed that I hope will be helpful to you, whether it's for your children or for yourself as you explore your own neurotype and your childhood and how it relates to these things we're talking about, I wanna emphasize that even though we can't see it as easily because the indicators are not as outward or disruptive or directed at us as parents, the physiological responses inside the body and the impact on basic needs, well-being, mental health is no less intense for an internalized pda because it's still the nervous system reacting. It's just not going down the fight-flight pathway. It's going either freeze shutdown or a hybrid state fawning and appeasement. But All of those states are not rest and restore or safe and social, which is what our body needs to be well, right? Both in terms of mental health, but also physically. So it's less visible, but no less intense. Okay, so the patterns I've noticed. First, in terms of the pathway towards PDA as a diagnosis or a neurotype that fits your child. For internalized PDAers, we often see extreme anxiety as a diagnosis and sometimes even OCD and then learning about PDA versus externalized PDAers like my son who have, you know, severe ADHD diagnosis, an oppositional defiant disorder diagnosis, and sometimes an autism diagnosis, and then learning about PDA. Okay, so it's two different like misdiagnosis or partial diagnosis pathways that lead to it. Second, the experience of parents of internalized PDAers versus externalized PDAers is different. And there are pros and cons to both, right? Like, I used to think, man, I really wish that my son was internalized PDA so he wouldn't need such constant undivided attention and I wouldn't be the recipient of what felt like abusive behavior constantly, the equalizing. However, the more I've worked with families who have internalized PDAers, I've come to understand the unique challenges of their experience because yes, a lot of the equalizing isn't directed at them and they aren't necessarily having to constantly engage every moment undivided attention. However, it is harder for them to understand the nervous system reactions of their child because the data isn't so obvious. And what happens is often these children are not identified until they hit burnout 
much later, tweens and teens, right? And then it can be much harder to understand the cumulative nervous system activation and track the indicators and engage with them to support them out of burnout because the data isn't obvious, right? And so it can, you know, there's pros and cons to both. Both are a unique and difficult experience, but there are uniquely difficult experiences for the parents of internalized PDAers. And then finally, there's a lot, I think, of additional guilt for parents of internalized PDAers because their children often have more equalizing towards self, which is like self-harm, negative self-talk. And then they also have guilt for not recognizing it until later in their child's life. But I want to emphasize that like the indicators and data of an internalized nervous system are so much harder to recognize because it's internalized, right? And so I just hope that if you're listening, and this is you, I want you to have self-compassion because you're not the only one, right? Like you're, you're not the only one that it took until your child was 15 to understand this, right? Okay, last pattern. And this is from my work directly with parents. So I would say between a fourth and a third of the parents that I work with, either in previous coaching containers or in our signature program, the Paradigm Shift program, either identify as P- internalized PDA or are realizing their internalized PDA as they go through the program and learn the nuances of their child's nervous system and brain and hear all the anecdotes of other families, etc. So I'm not sure why this is, but the majority of PDA parents that I work with are internalized expressions. And that might just be like who resonates with my personality and the way that I teach. But I do think it's an interesting phenomenon. So that is the broad overview of how to understand the differences of internalized PDA versus externalized PDA and how it relates to what you might observe as a parent and also your experience as a parent as you move through this awareness piece of how this does or does not apply to your child. It was so good to see you guys, and I will see you again soon. I hope it was helpful. Thanks everyone for being here with me at the At Peace Parents podcast. This is your source for all things related to understanding, supporting, accommodating, and advocating for your PDA child. To go deeper on any of these topics, check out my course offerings and masterclasses at the website www.atpeaceparents.com. To completely transform the way you think about and relate to your child and to bring peace and stability to your home, join us for the next cohort of the Paradigm Shift program.